Uh, um, so how much is that? So. Welcome to the podcast the editor mastermind show. The podcast by <laughs> podcast editors for <laughs> podcast editors and. Real quick, I'm Jennifer Longworth with Bourbon Barrel Podcasting, and I'm a proud sponsor of She Podcast Live, an in-person gathering, the largest, in fact, of women and non-binary audio creators, storytellers, podcasters, and more. And it's happening this June 19th through 22nd at the MGM National Harbor in Washington, D.C. So if you're someone who's passionate about podcasting, if you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed by all the different choices, and what you have to learn from whom and where and whatever, what are you going to do next? Come to She Podcast Live, ShePodcastLive.com. Check it out. Hope to see you in June. And below me, you'll find Brian Ensminger. And to my side is I'm Daniel Abendrell. And not joining us this evening is Carrie Caulfield Eric. You'll find her at Carrie.land. And we have a special guest today, Danielle. Yes. Yay! Hi. Danielle is from Kentucky like me. So that is why she's here. Well, not the only reason she's here, but that makes her extra cool. <laughs> <laughs> she's the owner of Octane Design Studios, a 13-year-old branding and identity firm based in the heart of the bluegrass here in Lexington. She's a podcaster, wife, mama of three, lover of rustic Italian cuisine, chai, cosplay, Star Trek's Picard and live MMA, and she is celebrating Star Wars May the 4th Day with all of us. Welcome, Danielle. I feel like we need to stop here and just kind of honor the fact that she loves Picard. Like, we could just take the show and move on with that. (sighs) Right? (laughs) Huge, giant Trekkie fan um, from birth. And I absolutely love the fact that um, even when we get to chat, about the technical list of things, I can always find a way to pull in a level of Star Wars or Star Trek. So you're welcome. (laughs) Great. And Danielle's our special guest today because she reached out to us after having listened to our website episodes saying she was talking back at the podcast as she was listening. And we want to know what she was saying to us (laughs) as podcasting is kind of one way typically, but uh, we want to hear what you were what you were telling us. <laughs> oh man, the episode was great. Like, can I just say, in fact, like the conversation, the lingo, the camaraderie, like all of that is just so, it's bubbly. Yeah. And it's infectious. Yeah, you can sing our praises <laughs> all day long. If that was what you were saying, this is going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> what else do you like well, about I was, us? I was leading, leading that into the next part, which was, we could use some help in the website area. <laughs> yeah. And I I definitely, I I don't have all the answers. I love the fact that you all lead from that place, which is we don't have all the answers, but this is what has been working. And I love that I can kind of help if anyone um, needs that as far as like direction for what you want to best reflect the services and the people that you want to seek. So I'm going to jump to the uh, should your prices be on your services page question. I'm I'm just going to just go right after that one because... I'm still struggling with it. As an editor, I do not. I do not listen. And that's a big one because the world tells us that we should have some sort of base, right? Or a base comparison. So I can do a starting point figure depending on what type of particular service I want to to aim for. So I love that. But the other part of that is, (laughs) right? Yeah, going right for the throat. The jugulars. Um, I really like the fact too, that, um, when we talk about listing our services, I push out those features, the cool parts of working with yourself, whatever that is. I know for Jennifer, it's going to be a bourbon tasting party. It's going to be maybe a bourbon listening party, maybe even like something in around the, I love uh, Jennifer is like my go-to person for all things podcasting. So I love the fact that for Jennifer, that could be a very specific thing. But what works for Jennifer isn't going to work for Daniel, right? It'd be a little bit different. Maybe you're stylistically a little bit different. So when we come about looking at these websites, there's not like a generic, you have to have A, B, and C. It really can be more conformed to who you are and the brand values that you want to bring through your business. 
I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, you know, I just spent several hours last week finding an excellent plugin so I could put my prices back on my website and they don't look like caca poo poo. <laughs> and what are you comfy with? Like, dude, what are you comfortable with? I was comfortable without them, but I was told, hey, like, let's do it. And that the research supported that. So I did it. It's been what, two weeks? It's too early to tell, oh, right? It's, yeah. I give you a good 30, 60 days maybe a full 90 just to kind of see if that would really give you uh, a quicker turnaround, maybe in communication with, with clients because they, they see your prices first or they are able to at least access uh, an ideal scale of what those prices could be. Right. I love starting points, you know, prices starting at X amount of dollars. I think Daniel, were you saying that before on, I think that was you. I, well, I don't remember. I know we talked, we looked at a couple of websites. I think Jesse's, yeah, Jesse's had like did. a starting ad or whatever. And I think, that's kind of like where I landed as far as like a good starting point or like a good middle ground. That way you don't have to like lay everything out, but you can get a, you know, the starting point price to kind of weed out the people who like definitely can't afford mm-hmm. your yeah. rates. Yeah. And to be fair, my starting point prices are definitely not the absolute bottom. I'm trying to get you in so I can sell you up later. Like this is what it would, this is what it would cost <laughs> you, but we can talk about scope, right? Cause if you publish once a week, Versus once a month, that's a different price. Absolutely. I love that you say that because I think that's a really big part of building out what you want people to see on your website. Is it, do I want them to focus on the numbers? Yes, to to a certain extent. Yes, I do want them to think about that. But the focus on weeding out, finding your people, finding your people is so important. To me, it's more important than the actual money they are paying me. I would rather have the value of a good client um, who may be in the mid range of what I would normally charge or in the range of services that we offer versus a really, really poor client who pays me a ton of money to do what I need to do. Because in the end of the day, at the end of the day, we can only take on so much. We're human. Um, even though a lot of times as editors, we're forced to kind of be little miniature robots, um, <laughs> droids, if you will. I think it's very interesting <laughs> that, yeah, as we kind of talk in and out about that, like, you know, as editors, sometimes we're seen as robots and we're just robotically going through life. And it doesn't matter how much it is because we can do it, right? And it's, it's, it's in our bandwidth. Um, so that's something to think about when you talk about listing prices. So what else needs to be on our website? I mean, what else were you telling us we were doing wrong? I guess okay. is the question. I really want to know this. You were listening. Yeah. You, you were talking back at us. You really want me to talk to us like in person about this or, you know, as in person as I we go. I personally just enjoy the, the level of transparency. And this is something that I do see on podcasts, but not enough. Like you guys were really kind of putting yourselves out there with, yeah, I'm comfortable with that or no, I'm not comfortable with that at all. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was a heck no. Um, I don't know what rating this podcast is. So I was making sure like there's a no fly zone for each of you on your own level. But I also feel like that's also curated based upon the experience you want to give your customers. So in hindsight, you want your your website to be a reflection of the people and the things you are trying to attract, right? A little bit of an attraction game, if you will. Um, So very similar to kind of, I'm sure there's certain questions. And I think you mentioned that before on the original episode was there's certain things that we have to ask so that we know what we're getting into. And I think that's a legit thing you have to know up front. Um, So that's that little tango dance that we talk about a little bit in terms of marketing. But in the sales part of it, there's also a little bit of a dance in, in trying to discover the things that you need to know up front versus the things that may come out in the wash later on as the relationship continues. So those are also things to kind of figure out how you want that to be represented on your site. Maybe, maybe that's an FAQ. You guys talked about having an FAQ on your site, whether or not that's a good idea, whether or not it's a bad idea. Um, but most people are having that on their website. So a lot of those questions that they're thinking about are already answered in black and white on your, on your page. Um, there's some other cool aspects that I feel like is kind of trending right now um, for websites. Tell us more. Yes, we need to know. Obviously, you guys have samples, <laughs> um, your playlists, things like that, that you want to share. Um, I am loving every piece of embedded playlists. Like the, That's like a huge thing that's not popular outside of podcasting, believe it or not. So um, I'm really enjoying that people are doing that more. But it's not necessarily samples of work. It's like my afternoon tunes my morning wake up call, like playlists that you would normally see like on Spotify somewhere, like you're trying to draw out a little bit more personality 
onto the sure. website. And people are doing that through through tubes, through music, through audio samples. And I think that's really cool. So maybe think about that as like a fun thing. Maybe not for the website, maybe it's for your newsletter, but that is something to kind of think about in terms of website. The other part that I really loved about the episode and I was kind of like stomping my foot about was whether or not to, you know, how personal do you want to be? Are you putting your face up there? Are you putting your business logo up there? What are the, I guess the 411, what's the behind the scenes answer on whether, on how close you want to be in proximity to putting your personal face versus a business logo out there. And I think that completely varies between who you are and what you do. If you're a podcast editor that's a little bit more meticulous, um, maybe you're focusing primarily in a certain niche. I love that Daniel focuses specifically on coaches. I love the fact that you were able to kind of find your niche there. However, for a lot of other people, maybe it's a free for all, right? Um, I edit podcasts from comics to music to the news. And so it's really important for me to um, be open. But for some people, maybe niching down is the better is the better option. So when I think about that, as far in terms of a website, I want to have all the things that are very popular or either somewhat trending in those specific specific niches. So um, that's really important too. For me, I'm a retro gamer. I'm a comic lover. So you're going to see me in cosplay pictures. You're going to see me in you know fun stuff in and around that community because that's who I am. And I want to attract more people like that. I, I've got a couple of questions. I, I oh, love sorry, that. Bring them on. <laughs> no, I didn't have... Yeah. Well, I do have just one question for Brian. What is the name of that plugin you found? I'll in have case? to look it up and send it to you. I, I don't remember. It was on okay. Theme Forest or Code Canyon or something like that. But I'll, I'll find it. It was, I think, 20 bucks or something. It wasn't much. Uh, but it's not terrible. Okay. I, I thought it looked pretty good. So one of the things that I wonder, and I think this goes back to all of the branding questions that you probably ask all of your clients. And so I'm not trying to get free consulting out of you, (laughs) but Uh, (laughs) it's Star Wars day. (laughs) This is where things get weird for me. So maybe not everybody knows this. I met my wife through an online dating service. And part of how that happened was filling out forms and providing information. And then, you know, there was, in my case, a thousand failed matches before I found the one that stuck. Right. And so there like it was super grueling on my side, but that's that's neither here nor there. Part of what the value of that was, though, was that they had those questions that help you understand what you're looking for, if it's a good personality match, that kind of stuff. How do we approach that from a business standpoint and go, these are the things that I need to communicate, knowing that there's no form out there that says, hey, we're going to match you to the perfect client? Yes. Oh, I love this. Uh, cool tidbit. I also met my husband on Facebook. Um, so I relate to that, like figuring out what what works <laughs> kind of like the switchboard right it's <laughs> i tell people it was like trying to buy groceries at the grocery store by looking at the label and going this one's got enough niacin or whatever it is and then you flip it around and you go um, but actually this one doesn't make me feel good so <laughs> we'll, we'll keep moving okay so we talk about forms for me i love forms because that is a great way to kind of directly slim or trim the fat right i think in a lot of ways You have to think about if you want to use a form to do that, um, how does that appear? How does that approach? Is it accessible? Is it easy? Um, Accessibility is a huge key and a huge turnoff point for a lot of people who are not comfy or savvy servicing and looking at multiple sites all the time. Um, When they're trying to find a podcast editor, a lot of times they're going the Jennifer route. They're going with people they know, people they trust, someone they've had a joke with, a drink with, something along those lines. So in terms of like cold, just looking up podcast editors in Google search somewhere and they have a form that they want to find more information out about you, I think it is important to kind of pull out certain things, but not everything. So I don't need to know their med- annual medium income for the year. I may ask something kind of fun and flirtatious, like what is your favorite color? Who is your favorite superhero? If it goes with your with who you are. Right. But I do think that forms do help kind of trim the fat. Um, really? Yeah, I do. I definitely have had people. When they, I expect you to tell me to just forget about it. <laughs> I definitely think it's a great way to weed stuff out. But there's certain times and places I feel like that can happen. Websites is one. Asking anyone for any service. If you're going to apply for a job, they're going to ask you the same question. So I do feel like that's in alignment with what you are trying to do, which would be ask 
asking someone, hey, I need to know a little bit more information before we either hop on a call or maybe discover more about the type of podcast services that you need. Um, So knowing ahead of time for me, when I'm doing any type of consultation like that, it's, hey, what do you need? Is it podcast services? Great. Tell me more about what's the name of your podcast? What is maybe something you want to do with your podcast that you're currently not doing? Also asking them, a funny question. Who's your favorite superhero and why? Um, sometimes <laughs> that's not a required answer. I just kind of leave it vague. <laughs> um, but it's one of those things that I do. I do want to know more information about who I'm working with before they even get to my face. Nice. Uh, Steve has a question. What would the negative consequences be for having a schedule a call button rather than a list of prices or having the podcaster fill out okay. a form? Okay, so... Based on experience and a little bit of factoid knowledge here, schedule a call is a lot of times for a consumer to kind of format a, I don't know if I want to talk to this person yet. Just as much as we do it on our side, that happens on the opposite side too. So even though when they're seeking like services um, for podcasting in any way, shape or form, sometimes it can be alluring to schedule a call. They don't want to make that level of commitment yet, but they are okay with looking at your prices and kind of knowing just the base information. Um, I'm definitely more of an introvert, believe it or not. I know I'm all over the internet, but uh, very much more of an introverted person. And I struggle sometimes, you know, even with, do I want to take this call today? Do I really want to be people today? Even though we set our own boundaries and in, 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 in scopes of, of realm for that. But the negative consequence, I think in, in some areas is too much pressure for the person to actually act on the schedule of call. Patrick said, I'd rather die than schedule a call with anyone. (laughs) I love that. That's definitely me a little bit sometimes. I definitely struggle with that. Steve says, (laughs) then you aren't my (laughs) ideal client. (laughs) Well, since Patrick's an editor, of course not. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. great. (laughs) The follow-up to that. So I have essentially like a schedule a call type thing. It's a built-in form. You go and you pick your date and time. And there's like a short questionnaire, but it's just like, your name, email address, whether you want a void, a phone call or a video call. And then like, how did you hear about me? And my idea was to keep it as simple as possible and not like overwhelm them and give them an excuse to not fill out the form with like having too many questions. And the idea that I'm toying with now is like keeping that and then like a follow up email being like, thank you. Thanks so much for scheduling a call. Just more information to make the most out of the call. Like, here's a list of questions that I have for you. Is that like asking too much, or like what? What are you, I guess? What are your thoughts on that? I really think that really depends on the client, and I feel like too, it depends on the gamut of what you're wanting to bring people in. If these people are already comfortable doing this particular, you know, questionnaire a little bit in between, um, then that's where you would want to go. Um, but if you also feel like you're maybe putting yourself too much, putting too much on the client ahead of time, then that also is a little bit lording to them to like, okay, if I have to do all of this just to talk to you, maybe I don't want to, you Mm -hmm. know, um, go that. So you do have to kind of mind what's on brand for you. If you're already showcasing to coaches that you're a likable person, that you are, (laughs) that you do your job well, you're already showcasing all the features and bonuses without actually giving them that sort of thing, then I think that is something you can continue to do. Um, just in my opinion, like when I have people ask me a ton of questions in a questionnaire, I actually, I love questions, by the way, just so you know, like, people <laughs> ask me, I'm like, yes, let's talk about it. But I love being able to answer questions. But if you're the person, sometimes that's not that, no, let me put it in an email instead. Like I don't want to necessarily have that one-to-one. Um, it's okay to put a little bit of a soft boundary between you and the client before that point. And I, I talk a lot in terms of boundaries, just because boundaries are healthy, but they're not necessarily meant to keep people out. It's just meant to let the right people in. And so I really emphasize that even for podcast editors on their website, you want to allow the right people in and kind of shush, shush, shush the people that you really don't necessarily want to, to do business with. Yeah. So the people who don't want to schedule a call, Steve Stewart has made it abundantly clear. He's not the <laughs> editor for you. <laughs> Check that box. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So Steve replied, for what it's worth, I haven't lost much time to people scheduling a call who weren't worth the chat. However, I can close more sales if I get someone on a call than through email or any kind of online activity. 
Yeah, I relate to that because it depends on mm-hmm. how salesy you are. Like if you're the person that can close that deal by just talking to them and hearing their voice, then bam, spam, that's it. Yeah. That's, that's that's the trick. Um, but for people who are not in that particular area, you know, I'm a person about the boundary. So I don't force things. If it's meant to be, it's meant to be. Um, mm-hmm. What's for you is for you. And um, I'm a real big advocate behind that. So one of the things that I've struggled with a bit in terms of how to approach this is the number of steps to getting somebody on the call versus the size of the first hurdle. So to your point, schedule a call for some people is absolutely a speed bump. However, I have concern also that if the first call to action is shoot me an email, then I'm inserting extra steps before we get there. And so like, I'm not sure how that interplay works in, in terms of what's the right... Because there's an element of momentum and handholding that happens if you say, shoot me an email, and your first response is, cool, let's set up a time, here's a link, or something like that. But I, I'm not sure, like, where's the decision point between creating momentum with an easy first step versus just it's a one-step process? It's options. That's really what it is. I can I can be, like, very, very upfront about that. It's a matter of what you're comfortable in letting in, but it's also a matter, of too, of what's accessible. Like... What is accessible? What's accessibility for you? And I think it varies um, per the type of podcast sure. editor that you are. Um, and I think that's what makes people want to either seek you out for that particular service and go through all the things or Yeah, or I not. mean, so for me, I, you, you may not know this, but I work a full-time job and I'm a professional editor. So if they want to talk to me between eight and five, wow. like, there's a good chance we're not going to talk mm-hmm. unless I can pre-schedule it during a lunch break a couple of days out. Because I have other meetings and yeah. believe it or not, the company I work for kind of expects me to show up and do a job. It's weird, <laughs> but they have this expectation, what? right? And so I have uh, to honor that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. There's a huge part of podcast editing for me that is such a natural state, right? A natural state of being. It's our, our after five, after five. It's the galaxy that's not ours, but far, far away, right? Um, Star Wars Day. So I'm trying to think out loud, like, in terms of wanting to put the right things on your website, it really is a reflection of your processes, the way that you do business, and your personality in some areas. Now, if you're a business business, like a corporation, mm-hmm. you're, you want to be a little bit more harder tone. I do agree that, you know, maybe there's less of that, your personal personality and more of your business persona or your brand, you know, value across that. And I see a lot of that in your uh, website, Brian, more of a, professional like brand brand this is who we are kind of feel even though it's pretty much a tag team your wife That's, right works with actually oh, it's cat. daniel whose <laughs> wife works with him my wife doesn't oh i got <laughs> it other way yeah <laughs> okay so that's that's really what i was getting at was like you know there's a there's a place in a tone that you can carry you choose whether that's more of a personality or personal brand or if that's more of a business business like you know corporate sort of feel and i think there's different approaches to both yeah because obviously mine's more personality brand driven and i'm i'm revamping Mm -hmm. the website thanks to this conversation and get ready um, to do it again (laughs) (laughs) i know well i they haven't started yeah, and, and I don't do my own. Someone else does it for me. And I sent them a, a mock-up of what I wanted. And it involves bourbon barrel staves to be more on target with, you know, being bourbon barrel podcasting. There was no essence of bourbon or bourbon barrels on my website before. And I'm like, you know, we need to change this. Bring back yes. the wood panel. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. And to Patrick's comment, uh, yeah, am I... Gorgeous room overlooking the sea that isn't actually just a wall with a green <laughs> cover on it. <laughs> so I do want to add in kind of a thought that I had about ways like people can contact you. Because I think if your website is doing its job and attracting the white, right people, they as long and as long as your website is accessible enough, they'll find out, find a way to get in touch with you. So I think like the most common thing is people scheduling a call with me or a video chat, but also like I do have contact form and I have like throughout my website, like send me a message, that kind of thing. And I have plenty of people over the years send me an email when they have like a question or they want form information. So for somebody like me who would rather like chat back and forth on email before I commit to like talking to somebody, like my website allows for that. People send me a message and we can chat that way. And for others that want to hop on a call right away, it's easy enough for that too. 
Yeah, this is very much a McDonald's, you know, situation Big, having your uh, way. Uh, so that's not McDonald's. <laughs> it, that's uh, Burger King. That Burger King? Oh, yeah. oops. I worked at McDonald's Sorry, when guys. that was coming out, and it was a thing. We started having to make everybody's sandwiches just the way they wanted them. It was a mess. <laughs> <laughs> the customization, how dare. Mm. Um, <laughs> but definitely in thinking like in terms of a little bit of a buffet, you can't cater to everybody. So if you're if you're really into the realm of, you know, um, all things Italian, then stick to the cuisine. I think it's really important that once you find what works for you to keep, you know, keep at it. I think that's what helps build more people, more interest into wanting to visit your site. And I love the fact that I think Jennifer at She Podcast last year, you did the coasters with the QR code yeah, yeah. on them. Is oh, that yeah. right? That's me. So I absolutely love that because that is a it's a personal item that you can give to someone, but it also is a direct contact to knowing more information about what you do and how you do it. So um, to be on, I kind of stole that idea. Don't, don't kill me, but I only use it. You're not the only one who's stolen that idea. People ask me where I get my coasters all the time. And I send them my affiliate code. (laughs) I love it. But yeah, we do um, gamer tokens. So I think that it's, it's really cool to be able to find someone that actually is really connected to you in a way that makes them want to know more about you. And I think the website is the place to do that. Um, of course, social media is going to be around forever and ever. And with new things like AI and things along those lines, we're finding more tools and accessibility ways for us to connect with each other. But I still think the website is still the essential place that you own to actually connect with other people. So. I just want to keep that in people's minds as well as we lean on other things to to you know entertain and, and bring people in through social media. So life. with my website, people, their idea, I, I told them on the front, I'm like, I don't know about this. Put my prices on. It was right after our pricing conversation. I'm like, oh, they put my prices on. And, and her idea was to do a contact me for a custom quote and take them to a form. So there's a schedule a call button on there and then there will be like a a custom quote button somewhere. Mm -hmm. Because I change my prices every day, depending (laughs) on who I'm talking to. One of you said that you hold yourself accountable by putting them out there. And then today I'm like, oh, it's this much. And then I went and looked up and I'm like, no, crap. I just cheated myself out of 50 bucks again. (laughs) Because I just said the wrong number. I had a nickel. What I tell a lot of people who work in any type of technical business is in regards to pricing always is you need to have more than one option um, and more than one way to display it. So when you look at like, I don't know, I'm trying to think engineers websites, when you're looking at other technical print shops, I worked in a print shop for almost a decade and I learned some amazing things in and around printing, mass printing, um, any type of printing. And what I learned is that they don't list their prices always up front. They always have a customization form or click this button to customize things along those lines. So that's a great alternative to not necessarily listing your prices up front. Again, starting at a starting point would be great so that people can at least wrap their minds around that. But having that custom quote where people can actually put down their customized thoughts and then you can reply with it with your own customization. Okay, you're getting some questions here. Yeah. So we'll go Patrick Okay. Patrick first, thoughts on maintaining your own site versus someone else doing it. He says, I love my professionally designed site, but I don't have as much control over it now. And since I'm the one who brought up that I, I can't design a site to save my life. And when I get control over it, I ruin it. So that's why I have someone else do mine. Thank you. But what do you think, Danielle? Because I design sites for a living. <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> not biased at all. <laughs> I know, right? I was like, hmm. Um, so yeah, everything I've made <laughs> before for myself, for my network, it's been by my hands or at least gone through my desk. So I do encourage people, if, if you're not comfortable with web design, find someone who is. If you are not, it's the same thing with podcast editing, right? People come to us because they're not comfortable editing their podcast anymore. As editors, we, we do that. We take that uh, leverage off their backs and kind of, take it on, right? Um, they become our little padwans. I really encourage people to do what's in their lane, right? Um, for me, I am very gifted at creating websites and podcast editing and graphic design. And I'm very comfortable with going from Star Wars one day and completely Picard the next. I'm okay with all of these things. 
but this is within my own realm, I'm within my own lane, what I'm comfortable doing. However, that might not be comfortable for everyone else. So really, I would lean on if you are comfortable to learn, then give this a good maybe. But if you're not in a wheelhouse of already trying to, to learn something new, if learning new things are really hard for you, don't. <laughs> Trust someone else who does it way, who, who's already doing that really well. Yeah. So like my personal story is I, I struggled first, like wanted to get a website because like I know how to design websites and like I'm very familiar with WordPress. Like I know I can do it myself, but I'm not so proficient at it that I can just like knock it out without any issues. And so after like several months of me struggling, trying to like create my website, I finally just like hire somebody to do it for me. But then like, I know enough to like maintain it on my own. Mm -hmm. My response to Patrick, as far as like having somebody maintain it or doing it yourself. So personally, I don't do a whole lot with my website. So there's not much to maintain. And I use WordPress. So like outside of updating plugins or whatnot, there's not a whole lot of maintenance that I do. So I guess I'm curious about like, what do you mean by maintaining it? And what kind of control do you wish you have that you don't have right now? Yeah. So I think maybe while we're waiting for Patrick to answer that, do we want to go on, move on to uh, Andrea's question? Yeah. Yeah. Andrea asks whether you have any thoughts on multi-page sites with a menu versus a single page scroll with bookmarks to jump. This for me is actually a brain buster that I feel like a lot of people struggle with, but it's really not that difficult. I love the fact that this question is, is brought up because a lot of people struggle with this. They think that by having a singular page, it kind of helps with the workload. But I will say endless scroll is something in 2023 we are very tired of. I, people are going back to a little bit more of the brochure website, which is I'd rather have three to five pages to look at that I can look at in one to two scrolls versus having an infinite page where I am infinitely scrolling forever and ever and ever. So I really encourage people for SEO purposes, it actually is good to have more pages that emphasize you than one page that emphasizes you. It's kind of one of those things where you don't know whether or not the domino effect can happen. You can't start the domino effect if you only have one page. So it's really an interesting concept when people ask that because I want to encourage them to branch out a little bit by having at least three, two to three pages. Um, but for the purpose of whether or not to have an endless scroll or multiple pages, I say go for the multiple pages. And can we keep the the second menu to like a minimum of like two to three pages underneath that? <laughs> I'm totally like, I guess I'm part of the majority. It's like, I cannot stand single page websites. It annoys me to no end. Yeah. And this is kind of where I can had to grow up quite a bit because I was the minimalistic person. Like, here's my cover page. Here's the basis of what I do. This is why I'm good at it. Now book me. And it was all like on that singular page. I've had to branch out a lot. And actually, this is where my, my blog really kind of took shape and form. So now that I'm able to have a website that actually showcases the main nuggets about what I do, they can have a deeper dive and go into like more category topics like products like top shows that I care about, or even uh, ways to help them manage um, podcast editing and how we can help them, all those, all those type of things. So the more that you're putting out there, it's the Gary Vee concept, right? The more we produce, the easier it will be for people to find and allocate and know more about us. And it's, very, it's a very true moment, to be really honest. Um, we talk about that even in terms for social media, for podcasting. People say, you know, stick to one or two good mediums you're really good at that you really want people to connect with you with and then branch off. And I'm saying, drive that car off the lot today. <laughs> um, really just focus on all the areas as much as you possibly can. Get in a good system of doing it and then start really busting out the level of content that you want to put out in specific channels versus, um, versus everywhere. All right. Back to Patrick. He has come back about uh, his his website, the editor is way different and there are things and instructions I have not to touch certain parts of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of his first clients who isn't hand, who's not hands off. So it's been an adjustment for both of us. Rules about image sizes, et cetera. So that's where the, the issue is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a tough balance there between wanting to have a website that you love versus one that you can actually adjust as you need to. 
Maybe you can get like a part time tinker pass <laughs> where he like gives you oh, like, X amount of like window. <laughs> like only between eight and two can you touch this website on um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then all the other days your your hands off. Can't touch And on like a clone website that you can make sure it works before you roll it out. <laughs> He says, blogging is where I started. So I struggled to get my site to look less like a blog. That's why I had it redesigned. Yeah, that's a different look totally. Yeah, I'm just curious. This is me just asking. I know you guys mentioned like Divi. Um, you guys mentioned like the editors that you're using um, in some areas. Is anyone like, how do you guys feel about Elementor? I use that a lot for clientele. So on a personal level, I've never used it, but it's just another framework, right? My opinion is, is. As, as long as it's a framework that I can understand, I don't mind having somebody else that designed it or something like that. I have one website that I work on that's not podcast related that I just do some updates that's built in a, on a different platform. And it's very designer focused, right? So it's very much on the visual. It's very heavy, all of that stuff. I hate it. But it's because I can't make it do what I want to do because it wasn't designed to work that way. And so that's that's where the challenge comes for mm-hmm. me. So... For me, the answer would be absolutely. If you want to have a professional designer of site, go for it. Just make sure that they use something that you're comfortable with in terms of the handoff. Now, if they're going to continue maintaining your site like Jennifer's is, well, then that's a different story. You you use whatever they're comfortable with as long as you don't mind being locked in, right? And we have Mm -hmm. another question. Yeah. Yeah, this one's great. About this. Yeah, the quality of a web designer can be very different. What would be good questions to ask a web designer to assure quality, functionality, et cetera, Daniel? Ooh, the gold mine. I love it. Okay. So first off, I definitely want to know how long they've been doing it. Um, And this is uh, a learned practice. Someone who's really good in their first year hasn't hit a professional road speed bump yet, but they have been able to do a lot of coding, right? So coding experience is good, but we also want to make sure that the business side of how they conduct business and do business is also legit. So look for someone who has a little bit of deeper experience who's been in the game for a little while. Two, look for one trick ponies. I despise them. (laughs) I don't want someone who's going to be able to just work in Joomla. I don't want someone who's just going to work in WordPress unless I specifically need, you know, the WordPress. I want someone who's a little bit more adverse, someone who is um, flexible. Maybe they work between two or three platforms. I personally work between three main platforms. None of them include Wix. I want to make sure like it is, <laughs> uh, I want to make it, yeah, deep down y'all. <laughs> no, uh, yeah. Um, but I want to make sure that it, that it works, right? Like it has to function. And then I also want to have a, someone who has a good portfolio. Someone who actually can show the work that's actually out there in the world that you can go and visit. A lot of people build a lot of tests and dummy sites, and I think that's great. I have plenty to spare in the 13 years that I've been doing it. But I think in a lot of ways that when you have something that is actually credible, that you can go and tinker on someone else's site and see if that's in comparison to some of the uh, features or aspects that you want on your site, that becomes real. So um, those are the main things that I feel like you should look out for. I always love personality with a smile. I love dark humor. So if anyone uses that, that's always kudos points for me. But um, it doesn't have to be that way. Find someone who really kind of initiates or sparks you. Because usually when that connection happens, you're more likely to have more of an actual relationship through this experience versus a cold exchange of just getting it done. I love all these cats (laughs) in here. Man, I haven't watched all this yet. I only listen. So this is cool that I get to see the cats. It'd be different if Carrie was here because she usually has a couple. So one of the things I love that you shared about (laughs) that was your perspective on what we should ask about. Because in my mind, if you're wondering what are your prospective clients wondering as they're looking for a prospective editor, it might be things along those lines. Are you a one trick pony? Do you have work that you can stand behind? Can you demonstrate that you've been doing this long enough that you actually know how to fix problems instead of just dealing with the perfectly recorded stuff that you did in audio school? like? Those are all key questions. And I love the personality aspect, finding somebody you click with, because like the person who designed my website, like he was okay, but it was hard to communicate. And so trying to, and especially if somebody you can't stand talking to or don't have like a good relationship with, it makes it more difficult to explain and ask for the changes and like what you want in your website. So having somebody you're a little more friendly with, it's easier to kind of like, work through that process. We can't all be Klingons and data. Hey. Okay. Like we can't. <laughs> Wait, wrong side. 
<laughs> so we have another question. Oh, actually, before we get to that, okay. I do want to another uh, thing that popped in my head when you were talking is you said you like you work with a couple of platforms. So people that maybe want to do it themselves, what are like your recommendation for platforms to work with and which ones to avoid? Sure. I do love working with WordPress. I do love Squarespace. I do love um, even Kajabi. I mean, those are some really top wigs that I feel like I'm I'm very adversed in. That takes a little bit of learning, especially Kajabi, if that's like your something that you see and you see that price tag and you're like, I don't know if I should invest on that level. We're looking at dropping through G's <laughs> real fast. But I think it's very really admirable for people who are wanting to take that leap and say, yes, I trust someone um, who's very skilled in this area to to do this work on my behalf. So I definitely love WordPress. I love Squarespace. Um, I have definitely done several things um, hand coded by hand. HTML5, get out of here. Um, <laughs> I know, right? High five. I've gone all the way to for, to the to the early parts of of designing, all the way to more intricate parts. So I do like WordPress, Squarespace. Um, those are my top two. Kajabi would be a third option if your uh, if your pocketbook is up for it. I have a bittersweet relationship with Kajabi. Kajabi. Obviously, I, I mean, the people who are just listening can't see your face, but when she said Kajabi, you had a, a visual reaction. Yeah. With them. Okay. <laughs> Side tangent, I like I've been working with WordPress since like when they still were primarily a blogging framework. My biggest gripe with Kajabi is there's no like clear formatting button. So whenever I copy and paste from like a Word doc or something and you go look at the HTML, you have like all this unnecessary code and it makes things look weird. Mm -hmm. So alternative is to like paste without formatting. And now you got to go in and like fix everything and put all the links back in. It's just like... It's one simple function would completely change my perception of them. I completely agree with that. That's Mm -hmm. a fair assessment. I've had some clients that try to do it by hand and say, okay, you know, I'm going to revel against this decade plus years of your experience and kind of wiggle it out on my own in 45 minutes. And they usually come back usually within a week or two and say their tails Mm -hmm. behind their, their tails tuckered in there. Yeah, you're right. I shouldn't have tried this on my own. Can you help me? And I get that. And then you've got the people who actually are are trying to you know learn something new, and because they've not experienced something else before, this is their new, and this is they they kind of precondition right or recondition in some areas. And I think that can also be a learning experience too. But I completely agree. If you're old school, you've been doing it mm-hmm. since the very beginning, and we're going back to you know the Matrix almost. <laughs> and I just feel like. <laughs> You, this would be a difficult challenge for you. So it really just kind of depends on your learning curve there. But I do tell people all the time, if you're looking for just quick, visual, friendly um, platforms, WordPress obviously is a definite go-to and so is Squarespace. Yeah, of, of those two, I think that Squarespace is probably the one that's a little bit more newbie friendly. I definitely, at least mm-hmm. my experience has been that WordPress is way more powerful and extensible, but I really don't care that much for Squarespace, so I never found out the limits of what it can do either. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, like, the the SEO compatibility alone with Squarespace, I think that was one of the cooler features. When Squarespace, Squarespace first came out, that was, like, their big push, was don't worry about the SEO as much. We've got your back. And having... I actually got to work uh, a, a little bit with the um, Inner Circle committee with Squarespace specifically. If you don't know about the Inner Circle, it's like the people who you know designed you know hundreds or even thousands of sites using the Squarespace platform. You can get kind of insider knowledge. You can get pre-releases, things along those lines. Check that out. Um, it's called Inner Circle. And um, I absolutely love that Squarespace went ahead straight from the bat and said, hey, we don't want you to worry about the SEO as much. We'll, we'll start taking care of some of that for you. And they did. They delivered on that promise. Problem was, was that when they started upgrading a lot of their older platforms to these newer platform websites, it kind of became a little bit more begrudgingly so. So yeah, we're going to give you more SEO, but only this much. <laughs> and then if you want more, you'll have to pay to play. <laughs> and so that got frowned upon, right? Um, so I think they did lose a little bit of their early audience in the beginnings of Squarespace when they made that transition. But now... For people who are just looking for quick, easy, I just want to type in a couple of you know answers to some of these questions. That is a definite go-to for people who are looking to just get started, either building their own podcast website or even um, creating a services page for the services they do in and around yeah. podcasts. I definitely agree with Brian that Squarespace is a lot easier to use. 
And another thing, it's impossible to break your website with Squarespace compared to WordPress. WordPress is really easy. You install one wrong plugin or you accidentally try to make an edit and end up deleting a client's entire website. Like, don't. (laughs) Now, this is the beauty of working with hosting providers who can provide up to the minute, 24 hour, seven Mm. service. I'm grateful for... For people who are not GoDaddy fans, I'm a GoDaddy fan. I've been using it for years. We're partners with them. We love the ability that we can in one click restore something that happened five minutes ago, five hours ago, five days ago within one click, all within less than 10 minutes of us logging in. I do like that accessibility feature. Other sites, other places have done that as well, but I just personally love having that accessibility through GoDaddy. We've been using them for eight years, almost 10. I I wanted to hit this one because it, it is worth mo- noting that with WordPress, there can be a lot of hack attacks. Uh, so just be careful. In fact, I, one of the sites that I manage, it's not actually my site, but I manage it, is dealing with that right now. There's been an uptick in Ooh, yeah. hack attacks. I use some security protocols that I have in place. And so I'm act like literally on this call, I'm still blocking IPs because it's bouncing from the Netherlands to China to whatever, right? That stuff is happening. But yeah. what are your mm. thoughts, Danielle, in terms of what tools we might use to protect ourselves from attacks? Absolutely. I use um, Security Stand. I have, I love being able to use Security Stand. What, how do you even pronounce it all the way? I even asked people, I even asked our customer service. I thought I pronounce it. Is it Security Scan or Security Scan? Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't know how the letters come together. Anyway. Um, I absolutely love using them. I use them for malware purposes all the time. There's also, um, oh gosh, there's another one. I use WordFence. I'm not sure if that's what you're thinking of. That's one I've heard of as well. I personally do not use it, but yes, I've heard of plenty of other um, people who are developing WordPress websites who use that as a base for um, malware protection, anything of hacking, things along those lines. So I encourage people do their homework. There is some innate things that naturally come, some from your hosting provider in regards to making sure you have uh, scans on your website on a daily basis. So that's also something to think about um, depending on where you're, wherever you are, whether you're with Bluehost or GoDaddy or... I think this is the one that we were talking about before. And I don't even know, is it... Ver- the virus die? Virus die. Yep. So this is one that I personally use and I definitely can guarantee that this is top tier. So I absolutely love to that even when we talk about malware protection, that people are aware of it because a lot of people still build their websites thinking that my hosting has it, but really hacking is just going to continue to elevate over time. So this is something that you should be very aware of and taking the proper steps to protect your website. Uh, Facebook user has a, a good comment. If you have your own domain for your website, it's always good practice to use an email like hello at your domain instead of Gmail Hotmail Outlook. So you can market your domain instead of Gmail and yes. look more professional. You would need your email hosting though, blah, blah, blah. Yes. But but mine mine breaks sometimes and Carrie broke her email once too. So oh, man. <laughs> sometimes it's a challenge. I love my business, business Gmail. I've never stopped ever using it. So it works out great for me. That's linked directly to my domain. I don't have to worry about, you know, and I... And for my team, you know, I have a team of um, team of six women across five countries. So it's really important for me to to make sure that everyone has singular working emails, domains are working together adversely in the universe. Um, so I think it's really imp- for me. This is a no brainer. Like I love being able to have that type of security. Gmail has not failed me yet. <laughs> Sorry, Carrie. <laughs> So one one of the things I'm wondering, as we think about websites, right, because we've talked about maybe some design elements and some of that stuff, but I think there are some of us, me included, who are wondering, like, is my website really working for me or against me? If you were going to go take a look at somebody's website, what are maybe a couple of things that you would have them look at and maybe try to self-diagnose some things before you start taking the next step? How fast does your page load? That's usually the number one indicator. <laughs> and what's a good, is it like less than a second, less than half a second? What's, what's your target? Um, I would say anything on two seconds. I mean, that's really, to be honest, two and a half. Okay. I hate to say even three, because sometimes even the third, it just kind of bogs down from there. I really tell people, if it takes too long for you to, to say, huh, then it's doing too long. Like it's, it's taking too long to load. So page speed is usually my definite go-to as an indicator, if something is not working well on your website. 
The second one would probably be if you're WordPress, what are your plugins? Taking a look at plugins would be the second area that I would look at on the back end, just to see if that's something that's all, everything's compatible, it's working for you. You wouldn't believe how many times, even though we say like auto update, (laughs) sometimes it doesn't necessarily auto update or something happens in between the last update and the current update to where it drops. And then you're just stuck and doesn't refresh at all. And if you go monthly refreshing your website, that could be a potential 30 days <laughs> of something else um, affecting your site, preventing people from wanting to interact with you, right? So we want to try to remove as many uh, website roadblocks as possible. So that would be another area to go to. Another one would be heavy file use. So if you've got heavy files on your site, now for a lot of people, they're like, okay, Daniel, what's heavy? Obviously, if it's taking forever to load the one graphic that's at the top of your page, your your hero graphic or whatever that may be, you need to rethink about resizing that or um, stripping it down a little bit in file size um, so that you can actually have it load up as fast as you want it to. Um, again, you have that three second rule for people to make that first impression of you. That's it. Three seconds. That's really it. The first three seconds, I can tell whether or not I'm going to keep scrolling. <laughs> or I'm going to lift up my thumb and scroll to another page. I'm going to TikTok instead of going to you. You know, that's really all you got. That's the that's, that's my main things that I would look at primarily. Thanks. Yeah, I'd be help. I feel like I've talked too much, so I'm trying to be quiet so everybody else can have a chance. <laughs> so having a good foundation knowledge, understanding for website design communication is important. Do you have any resources for that? Um, understanding website, yes. Me, I do all of these things. I teach on all these things. I actually have a yearly educational brand intensive that we host at the last three months of the year called Q1 Essentials, where I actually teach live class in a group setting, very similar to this. And we talk everything from resources for your website to domain protection to uh, basics of WordPress. Awesome. And where can they reach out if they want to talk to you? LexOctane.com. That is my jam. Instagram is my number two jam. (laughs) So you can actually hit me up there if you ever want to chat one-on-one. But uh, yes, those are the two main places that I would love for people to get. Awesome. Um, And quick note, apparently uh, hashtag podcasting is trending on Twitter. So Instagram's your jam, but I don't see it linked up on your website. I was going to go click through so I could grab your link. (laughs) (laughs) So... uh, it's at the bottom, okay. but I, I'm working on that. Um, so uh, to be really honest, our website's actually being redesigned oh, right now. Sweet. It's perfect timing. <laughs> it's being redesigned right now. So it comes out at the end of this month. So um, be on the lookout for that. It will include a playlist of power songs nice. by by the ladies of Team Octane. So it will be, uh, I'm sure, full of 80s ballads. Oh, nice. <laughs> All right. Final question. You said you're a retro gamer. Give us one gaming recommendation. And then we'll do pod decks. Ooh. Um, don't rush into the dead zone. Okay. Now, if this is this is something coming from Mario, years of Mario, years of, of Sonic the Hedgehog, years of Tetris. Don't go into the dead zone. You don't have to go in there. I know sometimes it's very like you want to go in there and you want to hurry up and, and just get it and maybe get the goodie or the extra or the bonus or whatever. You don't have to do it. You can just bypass it and get to the end. But I do tell people all the time, life is more like Tetris and less like Mario. So that's my quote for the Okay. <laughs> Put that on a t-shirt. I think you have it on a t-shirt, don't <laughs> yeah. you? Uh, no, but I do have like prints and all the things. So yeah, I'm, I'm sitting here with Sonic tonight. So we're, we're making it real. We're making it happen. All right. So... Danielle, give us a, a number between one through five. Normally, Brian does that, but he's uh, given me the privilege of doing the pod decks question tonight. Ooh, okay, um, I'm going to pick three. Okay, perfect. <laughs> if you could send a message into the... I think we've done this before, but if you could send a message to the entire world, what would you say in 30 seconds? Oh, shoot. Um, well, that's not my 30 seconds, is it? Wait, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> um, same thing. Life is more like Tetris and less like Mario. There you I go. love it. Don't bother Blue yet. Uh, mine would be- <laughs> 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 I would say whatever is bothering you is probably not as important or won't seem as important uh, in a few years. So focus on the good and live your best life. I think mine would require a megaphone, but it would be stop being mean to each other. Aww. Mm. 
I, I'm a parent too, so I'm saying that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, mine is, if you can't be good, be funny. <laughs> okay. And if you haven't answered the question, feel free to leave it on our website. You can just go to podcasteditorsmastermind.com, uh, find the episode number 76, and leave a comment on that blog post. Uh, Patrick says, mine is uh, be good children, which uh, is <laughs> good because he is a teacher, so... I'm sure that's probably something he says on a daily basis. And Mikhail says, be kind, which I think, mm. yeah, we need more of. Yes. <laughs> Steve says, thank you, Danielle, in the voice of Yoda. Much I have learned today. That's great. Uh, you didn't do it in the voice of Yoda. <laughs> I can't I mean... do Yoda's voice. I can barely do Brian's voice. <laughs> Danielle, can you do the Yoda voice for us? <laughs> oh. oh, man. I knew you were going to ask that question. <laughs> that's okay, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> yeah, if you want to be guests on the show, just do exactly what Danielle did. Go to podcasteditorsmastermind.com slash be a guest. Fill out the form. It sends us a message and we'll be in touch. And this is whether you are an expert like Danielle is and have incredible, incredible insights and information that you want to share to the community at large or if you are struggling with something in your own podcast editing business and you want the advice of your colleagues, it's all the same. Fill out the form and we would love to have you on. I'm Jennifer Longworth with Bourbon Barrel <laughs> Podcasting. You can find me at bourbonbarrelpodcasting.com. New website coming soon. I'm Brian Ensminger. You can find me at toptieraudio.com. And next to me is Daniel Abendroth. You can find me at rothmedia.audio. And our special guest. Oh. I'm Danielle uh, with Octane Designs, and you can find me at LexOctane.com. And not appearing tonight is Carrie Coppola Eric at Carrie.land. Thank you all for joining us, and we will see you in about two weeks, 9.05 Eastern Time. Thanks. Bye. Uh, so um, how much is that? Um, I, um, uh, um, 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 uh, um, so, um, 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 um